whisper in the prophetic saying, none of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. I think Dr. Hani is one of the great philanthropists, one of the great humanitarians of our current times. Dr. Hani El Banna, for services to Islamic relief. Hani El Banna. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, dear viewers, welcome to a new episode of Conversations with uh, Dr. Hani El Banna, one of the most important figures in charitable and humanitarian work. We talk about the contents of the forum global dimensions of humanitarian work and we also talk about his views suggestions and uh, advice for humanitarian workers dr hani welcome ya ahlan wa sahlan munawarin inshallah allah yibarik fik munawarin bik inshallah today's episode is uh, devoted to commenting on professor as'ad taha uh, Professor Asad Taha's lecture, which deals with the media issue in humanitarian institutions. And uh, uh, the first question that uh, arises in this regard is, what is the importance of the media for humanitarian work in general? Uh, media is one of the uh, most important soft power in any social work, political work, economical work uh, for a country or for institution, for a government, for community, for everybody. Uh, soft powers of any country, the, the two most important ones of them is uh, humanitarian organization and the media as well. Because media can reach uh, areas where nobody else can reach. Same like humanitarian work or humanitarian organization can reach areas where other organizations or other uh, institutions or other individuals cannot reach. So really media is crucial in any humanitarian work, but you have to understand the dimension of the media as an industry, not just photographs, videos, and voiceover and recording only. It is Beyond that, it's an industry, industry which actually support uh, humanitarian work, supports uh, social work, support political work, support economical work, support even military and security work as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in his lecture, uh, Mr. Asad Taha talked about uh, an important factor for the sustainability of charitable and humanitarian work, which is the trust factor. How can media contribute to building trust between humanitarian institutions and donors, partner organizations and governments, etc.? Uh, trust is a very important element as a bridge between the community, between the donors and the charity organization. Mm -hmm. And media can play a very important role in building such trust. Mm -hmm. If media will become, uh, we'll talk, be talking about the truth, mm -hmm. will be fair, will show transparency of the organization, will talk about the achievement as well as the failures of the organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, media could be a double-edged sword, where it could be destructive, by deceiving the community, deceiving the public, by putting mm -hmm. false information on the table, or by becoming very honest, credible, mm -hmm. and putting the right information on the table. I give you, uh, I don't have to give you an example with this building the trust. Uh, we have a company uh, dealing with recycling of clothes. Mm -hmm. And this company, because uh, it says what it believes in, and what it delivers, uh, customers from Africa, from Asia, are waiting for months to buy the, uh, or wait for the shipment. 
from this uh, company because it builds a very important uh, bridge between the customers and the, uh, the, the, the company, which is a trust. Whenever they open the container, they found the categories which have been mentioned in the email exactly there inside the container. And this is honesty, and this is uh, uh, talking about the truth uh, to the public. So that's why public are waiting for months to wait for the shipment, and they don't buy from any other company. That's why media, if it talks about, uh, if it builds a trust, it has to be very credible, it has mm -hmm. to be very transparent, and it has to say the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Mr. Asad Taha, uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, media in uh, humanitarian organizations, said that uh, media is still considered as luxury by some humanitarian organizations. Uh, through your uh, experience, Dr. Hani, uh, what is the reality of media work in humanitarian institutions? Is it a professional work uh, done by professionals? Or is it still primitive and luxury, as Mr. Asad said? I think some of the heads of the organization do not invest in employing the right people. Mm -hmm. They just get photographers, they get cameramen or camera women to mm -hmm. employ them to take some photographs and make some films. Mm -hmm. But they do not employ the proper uh, qualified uh, professional uh, media uh, personality who can look beyond the photograph, who can look beyond the image, who can look beyond the video uh, as, as well to send a message to the public, whether this message is a positive or negative. This is a problem with the mentality of uh, some of the uh, senior directors or managers of this organization. Even when they get those young uh, officers or young cameramen or young uh, photographers, they don't invest in them. Mm -hmm. They keep them for a long period of time without training, without guidance. So they will do the same thing again, or they will leave. This is how some of those uh, chairmen or managers or directors uh, look at media as just an image, not as a message, as just a beautiful photograph, not yeah. as, as, a, 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 as a message that they want to deliver to the public, mm -hmm. just uh, like a shot, not mm -hmm. as a, some, some, some image which can stay forever. I tell you the importance of media in the massacre or the discovery of the massacre of Sabra and Shatila. Mm -hmm. Sabra and Shatila massacre happened in Lebanon, in Beirut, in uh, summer 1982, and it was discovered by a journalist, a French mm -hmm. journalist, who put some photographs, just photographs, for effective photographs, actually, uh, which impacted the whole world. It mm -hmm. came from his French newspaper, and everybody was standing up and saying, what's going up in Lebanon? Another mm -hmm. image is the image of the uh, young, 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 young boy, a young child in uh, some part of Africa, mm -hmm. when he was uh, restless, uh, sitting down, tired, and the uh, vulture, and very, this very big bird, is approaching mm -hmm. this uh, child to eat it, because mm -hmm. it, it looks at it as, as something that he can take and can eat. And this photographer, the, it is image, won a lot of uh, prizes, but he ended up committing suicide, because mm -hmm. he could not be able to defend the child in this uh, village. See, this is the power of media which discovered the massacre of, the, uh, of Sabra and Shatila on one side, and actually led to the discovery of the famine in certain parts of Africa, country members of the country, and unfortunately, the, the genius photographer committed suicide because he could not be able to take the responsibility of uh, just showing the image of this dying child could be eaten by this big bird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the beginning of your comments, you uh, 
mentioned the training, media training. Yes. And uh, Mr. Asad uh, referred uh, uh, also to the issue of media training. Uh, it is known that humanitarian institutions are interested in training in the fields of governance, for example, project management in particular, and other vital training programs. Is the media included in these uh, training programs? Not in every organization, unfortunately. Not every organization believe in training or training the staff, the media staff, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But let me uh, introduce uh, Mr. Asa Taha to the viewers, which I forgot to mention at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Asa Taha was a journalist in the 80s, specialized in the Balkan region and the Central Asian Republic. Uh, I met him first time in 1986 in Munich in Germany in a conference and he was just joking with me tell me how can you say a penny a day keeps the famine away and you will be actually raising all this fund uh, as other. Well. Mm -hmm. As Ataha uh, was uh, the one who helped us to register our offices in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, in Azerbaijan, in Ukraine, in Russia and in Albania at the beginning of the 90s. Asataha was a uh, 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 representative of NBC television in uh, Sarajevo, uh, in Bosnia, uh, from 1992 uh, till 1995, 1996. And to be very honest, he is the one who made uh, this big organization, NBC, NBC, uh, Mid East Broadcasting to become this only uh, broadcast in the Arab region. As at this war, during this war, he he could have been killed because a shell uh, fell on 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 his office, and he came out injured with the dust on his head and on his hand and on his body. Mm -hmm. This is Mr. As mm -hmm. As Atta, as somebody who has a need and experience of forty years of media experience and uh, field work, was trying to train young people and to make them media professional individuals. And he was calling for people to come for a, a long uh, week, no, not uh, two weeks uh, program in Malawi in 2017, 2018. It was costing about 2,000, 3,000 dollars full board with training and everything. The mm -hmm. organization which you are talking about never gave a damn about sending the young officer to be trained by mm -hmm. somebody very professional like Mr. Asata. And up till now, Asata is trying to train and to build up the career of the young people in media. Because media is not holding a camera like this. No, mm -hmm. it's not holding a camera like this. Is not holding a, a microphone. Media is an industry, and media mm -hmm. is a profession as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I during 2001, uh, I'll tell you the cost. He wanted about 2,500 dollars for two mm -hmm. weeks. When we decided to confront the media in Islamic Relief in 2001 and to stand up to defend uh, mm -hmm. Islamic Relief and to defend the Muslim community in Europe, we decided mm -hmm. to go to be trained for one day. For one day, the five of us paid 5,000 pounds for a day. Mm -hmm. And one pound, sorry, 1,000 pounds for each one of us. You can imagine, if we went, if those people who organized this training program of our English or uh, uh, English or British, uh, mm -hmm. were organizing the, the, the training program of Asata, we could have charged people uh, 20, 30,000 pounds. And mm -hmm. our organization will pay. Because you know why? Because they have blue eyes. They are blonde hair, they are actually not Arabs, not Muslim. I'm for this as an com inferiority complex. And I witnessed this between the two experiences. The experiences, the experience in London, which cost us 5,000 pounds for one day, and the experience of Asata, which was trying to train one individual for two weeks in, in intensive training, mm -hmm. uh, full board, mm -hmm. actually, with about $2,500. And I hope 
that whoever is listening to me today can ask us on how to contact Mr. Asata to make this program to train the young people. Inshallah, inshallah. Uh, Mr. Asad Taha spoke also about uh, the need to pay attention to the new media. Yes. And uh, uh, it is known that this uh, uh, new media has begun to attract uh, the attention of humanitarian institutions, including the United Nations organizations. Mm. Uh, allow me, Dr. Hani, to show a tape about uh, the Kuwaiti YouTuber Abu Fulla, and uh, you can comment after that about this kind of uh, promotion of humanitarian projects. Fulla. Abu Fulla is an Arabic YouTuber with over 23 million subscribers on his channel. Yesterday, he managed successfully to raise over 11 million dollars for a big charity under the name. Let us make their winter warmer. He locked himself in a glass cube that is only 5 by 5 meters continuously for 11 days while he was still live streaming and trying to collect the donations. <laughs> Before starting the charity, he uploaded a video on his YouTube channel and he said, I don't care how long this is going to take, one day, two days, one week, two weeks. He said, all I know is that I'm not going out of this glass cube until I collect 10 million dollars from the charity. The goal of the charity was to protect over 100,000 refugee families, which is around 300,000 human beings from the cold winter. Not only this, but he actually broke two Guinness World Records at the same time. The first record was most viewers for a charity donation live stream on YouTube with around 508,000 people watching his live stream. And the second record was the longest live stream that lasted for 268 hours. I really don't have enough words to describe this much. 11 million dollars. Uh, what do you think, Dr. Hani, about this kind of promotion uh, of humanitarian programs? Uh, the new social media is very important because mm -hmm. it attracts the younger generation the younger generation in the Arab world and in the whole world constitute about 60 70 percent. Mm -hmm. It talks about the philosophy of thinking, about the language of behavior, about their attitude. Abu Fullah bought two, three challenges. He said, I'm going to put myself in this uh, box, glass mm -hmm. box or glass tube, no matter how long it will take, actually to raise $10 million. And he managed to raise 11 million dollars. There was a clear objective, actually, for Abu Fulla, which is to raise funds to help the Syrian uh, uh, displaced people inside Syria at that time, and he managed to do that. And this is one element, is the challenge. The second element is his uh, professional performance to attract the younger people. He understands, actually, how, what attracts them, because he's a young man like them. The third one, which made him to make all this money, is his partnership with the uh, with, uh, United Nations and the city of Dubai. So people knew who are donating that the money will be given to a credible organization. That's why they donated. So the, the success story here is mm -hmm. one of them is the performance of uh, Abu Fulla. The second one is the challenge that he put himself in this glass box. The third one is the partner with uh, Abu Fulla, uh, which mm -hmm. is United Nations and the city of Dubai. But on the other side, if you remember the same year, uh, young, uh, not influencer like Abu Fulla, uh, young Palestinian wanted to raise for the same people uh, uh, from Palestine, mm -hmm. uh, the same amount of money. And he made through the social media, he managed to raise $10 million with other kind of direction 
with other level of organization like Ata from uh, Turkey. He himself was not as famous as Abu Fulla, but the same objective was the same. The objective was actually to raise the fund for the Syrian in winter. Actually, but the organization here was Ata, and the other YouTuber was not Abu Fulla. Uh, for these two, if you if, if you manage to 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 com make a comparison between both of them, you found mm -hmm. that the other one was more uh, powerful. Why? Because the United Nations was not there. The city of Dubai was not there uh, as well to make people. And the third important, most important thing, most of the donors were Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Most of the donors were Palestinian. And this was not the first time that the Palestinian inside Gaza or Rafah or, uh, or uh, Dir al-Balah or Jerusalem or uh, uh, Nablus or Nazareth donated this $10 million dollars. Actually, from a, from a poor people to another poor nation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this actually when you call it, so, so social media is a new art of media. Mm -hmm. Art is, is something like you have to learn mm -hmm. to be able to make it, then to test it, because not mm -hmm. everybody will go to the Louvre in Paris and look at this painting and say, "Oh, why was this waste of time?" Because he has not got the mind and the skills to understand the painting of those people in actually, which very famous like in Michelangelo in Italy and the other people as well. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the art uh, in this episode, uh, inshallah. Uh, Asad Taha spoke in uh, a very important sign uh, about the importance of writing the biographies of humanitarian ah. <laughs> you are actually uh, opening up uh, a Pandora box <laughs> this is my this is my uh, appeal to many organizations to many organizations for years to record the history before the people who started this organization will die. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you one or two examples. Most of the Arab stroke Muslim international humanitarian organization did not write the history. Most, I'm not taking, I'm not talking about all, especially the big ones which have the resources and they can do it. Unfortunately, they did not do it. They do not value it. And I was approached by somebody from a big organization. And they told me, I want you to write the history of our organization. I said, okay, fine. Writing a history is a very tedious a problem. It needs money, it needs resources, it needs time. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I told him, how many offices your organization have? Say about 30 offices or 25 offices. Mm -hmm. I told him the history that I need to observe writing, observe, mm -hmm. or to manage the process of uh, capturing the data of writing it has to be written by the people in each country. Mm -hmm. Like how it, this organization started its office in Morocco, in Algeria, in Tunisia, in mm -hmm. uh, Libya, in Egypt, in UK, in USA, in uh, Canada, in Australia, and, and, and. This is not me who is going to write it. Because if I'm going to write it, as you think I am, it will be my own view. But mm -hmm. actually, even if I'm the founder, of this organization. How many times I have traveled to a country and how many days and weeks and months I have lived in this country to give me the, the authority to write a history about the office which is stayed there for about 20, 30 years. He told me how much this will cost. I told them if you have 30 countries or 25 countries, the organization is as old as 30 years old. You talk about millions. I said, what? Millions? I said, yes. Because, first of all, you have to set up the standard and the parameters of writing this history. Like, actually, the history could be written according to the same criteria in all the countries. Mm -hmm. Then we collect the data, then we organize the data, then we publish the data. And this will take at least three to five years. And I want from you at least, actually, uh, $3 million to start with. I said, what? $3 million, why? We can give you 100000 to 100000 I said, you are not writing history. 
you are asking me to go to the library and to write something through my own opinion. Well, this is wrong. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Those people did not understand the value of collecting the raw material, the data. You see, if you go to an area that actually you started working in, like in Africa, what information there is like gold or sand gold, you need somebody to capture it and bring it back to your, your headquarters. Then you need to put all together to refine it and make it gold. Mm -hmm. to purify mm -hmm. it, make it gold, then to present it to the public as mm -hmm. necklace, as rings, as bracelet, as uh, 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 belt, and, 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 and. Because all the information in this area, in these offices, are like gold, like mm -hmm. diamond, like pearl, and all this sort of thing. And it's not, it's not just something, somebody sitting in a, in a dark room, and, writing, and actually, they, they did not finish the, or they stopped the discussion with me. And up till now, even I'm still, some of the members of this organization talking to me said, yes, the $3 million is too much. I said, what do you mean? You make a media campaign for Ramadan. You make a media campaign for Kurbani. You make a media campaign for Afghanistan or for Pakistan. Flood. It costs you millions. You don't mm -hmm. write the history once to keep it for next generation and cost you three to five million dollars, especially uh, since you have not uh, uh, wrote, uh, wrote it actually from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You have not uh, written it from the very beginning. And of course, the project was stopped. So my, in my own opinion, any organization, humanitarian or social or political, if it does not write the proper history, mm -hmm to be left for the generation to come, they are criminals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the younger generation, will talk, how can they know the achievement? Mm -hmm. How can they understand how this work has been built? They found that a huge organization, how it started, nobody knows, because nobody mm -hmm. took care of writing the history as it should be written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, uh, it will cost because uh, it must be written in a way that includes more than statistics uh, and traditional information. Uh, it, it must be uh, art, and that's why uh, it will cost. Allow me to ask you about uh, uh, another important topic, which is uh, related to the ethics of humanitarian work. Some uh, media reports always uh, raise the question of the ethics of humanitarian work. So you find uh, many exaggerations in showing the need of uh, the needy. And this uh, uh, insults the dignity of the uh, uh, as you uh, call them, people with rights. What is your view, Dr. Hani, of the al alternative in this regard? Uh, if you remember, as I mentioned before in different meetings, the first introductory speech of this uh, meeting in Istanbul last mm -hmm. month was about manner, ethics, and behavior by mm -hmm. Dr. Sheikh Hassam al-Bashir, uh, who eloquently managed to deliver it excellently. Mm -hmm. So we started with manner. We started with uh, ethics. Mm -hmm. Every work, every speciality has to have ethics, values, morality, medicine, agriculture, industry, market, politi marketing, po uh, politics, uh, business. All this must have, must be guided and controlled by the ethical values of the sector itself or of the organization uh, 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 as we speak. So uh, media oh, is one of the most important speciality which should have this uh, controlling uh, the, the, the images that they actually uh, uh, present uh, on, on the Facebook or on the television or under the other media platform, actually. The, the dignity of the rights holders, which has Habil Hukuk, Mm -hmm. is more important than the photograph you are taking. You have to take their permission. 
You have to understand that you are dealing with human being, having feeling, having uh, emotion, having uh, future to think about, having family relationship. That's why when you take this photograph, first of all, you have to have their consent. If they don't allow it, don't take it. This is number one. Number two, don't perform, don't show them in a very miserable way. Mm -hmm. Number three, when you give them, uh, uh, what do we call it, uh, a box of, uh, uh, what do you call it, food, food box, or you give them uh, uh, a bag, for, a bag for the, for the child's school bag to go to school. Don't put your logo. Don't mm -hmm. put your logo. Because if you put your logo on the school bag for the child, whenever he goes to the school, all the other children will be laughing at him and calling him names because he is receiving this uh, uh, school bag from a charity organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I believe strongly that actually some of those children refused to uh, carry these school bags, which cost uh, um, 50 or 40 or 30 or 60 dollars, and they throw it away because they don't want to be seen in front of the school or their colleagues or the neighbors that they are taking a charity from you. This is where we talk about the dignity of the individuals. If you come to me, why you come to me in, in, in a very big, huge uh, uh, entourage and show everybody in the, in, in the field or in the, in the neighborhood that actually this organization is coming and each one of your people wearing a, a t-shirt with the logo. And even when you give me a t-shirt, you put your logo into it. So whenever I wear it, the, the, the people will say that this is a donation from the organization. Here, we have to measure the feeling of the children, the women, and the families who are receiving this donation from you and why you should keep sticking this logo all the time at the boxes or at the school bags or at other mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Asad Taha, uh, who is, uh, as you mentioned, a director, artist, and uh, trainer in documentary film, talked about uh, uh, some of the techniques that take the media product from stereotyping to creativity. He talked about uh, Al Hikaya. Uh, uh, story. Yes, the story. Uh, let's watch this ad from uh, the Water Project, which will explain uh, what Mr. Asad uh, means. Well, uh, Mr. Asad Taha is a very good storyteller. Mm -hmm. And the storyteller is something that we learned long time ago from uh, uh, my, our grandmothers and grandfathers when we used to live in one big house 
and uh, El Gidda or El Habuba used to come and sit next to me in the, or stay and sleep next to me in the bed and keep telling me about the, the bedtime stories. It's very, very important for a child, very important for an old man, very important for a grown-up for grown man, and very important actually for uh, young people uh, who are at this age of 20 and 30 and others. So the storyteller or the Hakawati is very important dimension, but it's very old in the history of, uh, if you call the storyteller, which come to the villages actually, and showing the images of the, 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 the history uh, in, in, in this black box uh, camera. Actually, you know that this happened in your villages in Morocco or in Cairo, in, in northern Cairo, in Egypt, or in Africa, hundreds of years ago. But actually, what we have seen in this short video is uh, what we take for granted in Europe and the America and our countries is impossible to be taken for, for granted in Africa. What we go to the toilet or to the kitchen to open the tab and to get the clean drinking water, a woman in Tanzania, in Mozambique, in Mauritania, in Mali, in Senegal, in, in uh, uh, Chad, in Central African Republic, in Congo, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, will take uh, miles and miles and miles to uh, capture or to collect uh, dirty water. I saw mm -hmm. it with, uh, uh, in Arabic, said with, with Umma, I to have Umma Aini, and in the English, Arabic is the mother of my eyes, which does not make any sense. I, I saw it with my own eyes when I was in Tanzania, that actually the young woman actually carrying 10 liters of, mm -hmm. uh, of water, uh, 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 a jug of 10 liters of water on, the, on her head, dirty water, and walking back for miles to where she came from. I saw it also in Kashmir in 1997, 1998, when we visited the villages on the top of the mountains, and we found that the young girls are not going to school because her, 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 her duty is to help the mother at home and to get the water from the valley. So she used to go down from the, from the top of the mountain to the valley to collect five liters of water on her head and climb again and five, six times a day. It's about, it took about five, six hours. There's no time for schooling. That's why we uh, uh, started the water reservoir uh, uh, project on the top of the mountain. This is very, very, very clear in this area of the world. That's why this was the message given to the people who might think that water is something we we'll go anywhere and ask for it and is there available for us. And that's why it is what it was very powerful and were very active and it should have raised millions and millions and millions of pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, allow me, doctor, to uh, show some uh, followers' comments on your page. Uh, Islam Asma uh, said, uh, good luck. Uh, Arab Skenga following all the way from Malawi. Uh, Khadija Saleh, uh, she commented, May Allah reward you, Dr. Hani. An outstanding uh, program. Another comment from uh, Abu Mahmoud uh, Al Uthman. Um, uh, excellent, uh, informative, and useful uh, uh, lecture. Another uh, comment from Al Markaz Al Magharibi Lil Wasata Wa Al Tahkim, the Maghreb Center for Mediation and uh, Arbitration. Uh, he commented, uh, May Allah protect you and take care of you. Uh, another comment from uh, Ibrahim Muhammad Al Khazan, uh, I salute you. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we come to uh, a comment from uh, uh, Ihsan Doski. Uh, uh, he says, there are a number of uh, individual initiatives, but uh, uh, these creative and individuals do not want to join uh, associations 
how can we convince them that teamwork is better? Uh, uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, initiatives are there everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Whether you are in Africa, in a very underdeveloped countries, or in the United States, in a very developed country. They are there. Because human being is human being, and the ability to be innovative is there. Mm -hmm. So innovation is something that you can't stop. Actually, children in the street could be innovative, women at home could be innovative, and young people uh, uh, in school can be innovative. So this is something we have to realize and we have to accept. All of us have got source of innovation or uh, uh, innovation inside ourselves. It's up to us as leader of the community to discover this uh, innovative methodology inside each child. Mm -hmm. And uh, each child has been born talented. But you have to discover the talent that this child or this child has. And you have to look after the talent. This is actually at the beginning. If we found some young people are making uh, pioneering initiatives, we have to build the bridges between us and them. Yes. We have to communicate. We have to talk to them. And we don't have to scare them because some of them will think that because you are a very big organization, you are coming to take their initiatives, are coming to buy their initiatives and sideline them and ignore them and maybe giving them uh, a, a small salary for this or a small token of appreciation for this. No, I have to, mm -hmm. first of all, to, as you mentioned earlier, to build the trust between you and them. Once you build the trust between you and them and they will start to listen to you, they start to come to you and explain to you uh, that actually their initiatives and how they made it very, very successful and how it becomes very impactful. The initiatives of, of a fuller is an initiative. It's not a project. It's just he said, I'm going to sit in this glass box for as long as it takes me to raise 10 million pounds, 10 million dollars. And he did it and raised about 11 million dollars in about uh, 11 days inside the box. Uh, this kind of initiatives, if you go to Abu Fulla now, when he has 23 million uh, followers, tell him, come and work for me, he will never work for you. Mm -hmm. Because he himself, by himself, became an organization or an institution. Mm -hmm. But the least you can do is to build this bridge of trust between you and Abu Fulla and make Abu Fulla to be your mm -hmm. partner as an individual. Actually, some of the other young people could be able to look at it differently. Say, okay, fine, let me be a part of a bigger organization, but let me have a say on my project. Mm -hmm. What do you mean have a say? If you get, so if you want to attack somebody like Abu Fulla and bring him to your organization, uh, he is not looking for money because he is making a lot of money from his 23 million followers, but he is looking for a status. He's looking for a space and give him the space give him the facilities, give him the resources to enable him to grow up more and more and more and more. Otherwise, why should he come to you? If you tell him I give you this amount of money every month, he will not come to you because he is not looking at the money because he can make the money every day from his own uh, YouTube. This is the second thing. So the people who are thinking to join this uh, big organization has to be given the space. Mm -hmm. has to be given the freedom, has to be given the power to be empowered to run mm -hmm. their own initiatives, not to just be a part of a program that actually you are having and you treat them like any other employee. This is point number two if they want to come. I gave you an, uh, an example of another uh, very simple initiative which happened in Mosul. In mm -hmm. Mosul, you know Daesh, what Daesh has done to Mosul, mm -hmm about 15 years ago or less than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned uh, before that may Allah curse Daesh, curse the people who created Daesh, curse the people who supported Daesh, curse the people who let Daesh to come to Mosul, unfortunately. And this is how you can actually look at it. When the Daesh people who had nothing to do with Islam and Muslim, who have no relationship with those kind of individuals who have no relationship with us or no relationship with Islam. 
they destroyed everything, especially the uh, all the historical places, including the mosque of an Nabi Yunus, alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. The mosque of Nabi Yunus, I visited Mosul Island myself in Iraq, and I saw how they destroyed the mosque of Nabi Yunus and how they excavated a lot of graves in Al -Mus, the old Mosul, unfortunately. After what uh, Daesh did in Al Mosul, it, oh, you know that the old city of Mosul is very historical and the roads are very narrow and it were filled by stones and rubble and all these sort of things. And uh, some of the big organization calculated the estimation of clearing this very small road in hundreds of thousands of pounds at that time. You know, some young man like yourself or younger than yourself, his name was the Noon. The Noon. His name was, was the Noon, because he was from Mosul. You know what he has done? He hired what we call a Dunbar. Dunbar is like the Tuk Tuk. You know the Tuk Tuk in Egypt? Yeah. But it's smaller. He has a driver with like, like, a, like a motor, motor, motorcycle with a small box at the back. And he used to give the, the, the driver two or three dollars every day to clear up the rubble because it can go through the, this uh, narrow roads. And instead of costing uh, the, the, the city or the country hundreds of thousands of dollars, his project, when he cleared the rubble from 10 areas, actually it was $30,000. And he was awarded uh, one of the prizes from Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, the Sheikh of uh, Dubai, Dubai, for his pioneering. Somebody like the Noon, if you want to bring him to your organization, you have to give him a space because he has the brain. And if you have the brain, you have to get the space and the facilities to enable you to think and to enable you to uh, produce more ideas and more uh, uh, initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hani, uh, and uh, many thanks to uh, our dear followers. Next week is uh, full of uh, very important topics that you will find on uh, Dr. Hani's page. We will meet you at the end of the week to comment on them. And uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before we go, Okay, okay. Can I just make a final comment which she made by Asa'at Taha? Don't ever send somebody who is not interested in media to be trained in a workshop training people from media. Don't ever send those people. They will mm -hmm. never learn. Mm -hmm. Not because he or she is an officer, uh, she might have a come to your organization because mm -hmm. they want a job. Mm -hmm. Those kind of people will never learn because they came to your organization just for a job, to earn some money, but not to be a professional media individuals. So what as I say, media is something that actually like an art, as I mentioned before, has to be taught to the younger people from the younger age, and actually has a schools of learning and teachers and professors to teach you, to teach the people who have the ability to become media, a man and woman, who wants to become a media TV presenter or artist or whatever you call them at the end of the day. But don't ever and never send somebody to the training before because he's just an officer, a media officer. Send mm -hmm. the people who want to become a, a media personality and media professional. Mm -hmm. They must have uh, passion. Uh, okay, dear followers, next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani. Thank you. Dr. Hani was a strong believer in the prophetic saying, None of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. <laughs> I think Dr. Hani is one of the great philanthropists, one of the great humanitarians of our current times. Dr. Hani Elbana, 
Paul Savage's to Islamic Relief. El Benda.